All right, get out your Bibles on the count of three. Say word. Hold them high. One, two, three. Word. Oh, man, you guys are ready today. Man, I hope, you're as, I hope I'm as ready as you are. Uh, open up to Romans 12. As we turn the pages of Scripture, let's turn the attentions of our heart to the Lord in prayer. So I invite you to pray with me. And even if you feel led, you, I welcome you to get on your knees before the Lord with me where you're at. Um, and let's, let's pray. Ah, Lord, you are so good. There's no shortage of good things to say about you right now. There's no shortage of good things to thank you for right now. There's, there's no shortage of good right now because you are good. Infinitely good. And we, right now, Father, we just, we posture ourselves before you in, in humility, in, in reverence, in submission. We posture ourselves in submission to you right now. And, and may that be an eternal posture of ours. Today, after the service is over, as the week goes on, may we be in a posture of submission and surrender to you. Father, I pray for your intercession upon the presentation of your word, that, that I would speak your word well, that it would land well in hearts and move, try, renew minds and move hands and feet, and, and that we would be the body of Christ in action in our communities. God, would you bless the, the big aspirations you've given us to make three million disciples, to plant dozens of churches, to, to make, to, God, we want to make it hard to go to hell in Yankton because nobody can go anywhere without hearing the gospel. Help us to do these things. And may it all, may it all flow out of these services of worship and our, our small group gatherings and all these togethernesses that we have. May they just equip us and be vessels that, that propel us to the fruition of everything we just spoke of. But we pray these things not according to our will, but according to yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we are in a series called Jumpstart. We're in part three of Jumpstart. Energize your faith. Week one, we talked about clinging to what is good. Rejecting what is bad, right out of Romans 12. Uh, week two, last week we talked about energizing your faith by posturing your life so that you would choose trust over worry. All these moments in life, we have a choice. You're going to choose trust, or you're going to choose worry. And we're going to dwell on what is good, reject what is bad, and we're going to choose trust over worry. Today I want to talk to you about what is arguably one of the most spiritually energizing things God has given us, but is probably one of the least talked about things in a church setting. Today what I want to talk to you about is incredibly empowering. It's, it's extremely spiritual. It's phenomenally energizing. Science shows that the thing we're going to talk about today actually has side effects that are positive for your health that are good for your mental well-being, the things we're going to talk about. Your physical health, your mental well-being are amplified by what we're going to talk about today. Do I have you a little bit curious of what we're going to talk about today? You think you got to know what we're going to talk about today? Um, we are going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about Christian generosity as a spiritually energizing activity that God has given us. I want you to think about this. God has designed every one of us so that there's something in how we're built that is is blessed, energized, like I said, healthier when we're in a posture of generosity. We're in a posture of generosity. But since it's such a, such a tricky topic, let me tell you first what today's message is not, especially if you're new, okay? Um, here's what we're not doing today. We're not taking a second offering. Today's goal isn't to make more money in today's church service. That's not the goal today. So um, I have a friend who says people are funny about their money, and we only do an offering serving once every year or two. Um, so if you're new here, this is the one time of the year that we talk about this. Uh, I had a friend I was trying to get to come to church for two years, and he came to church on Giving Sunday, and the, he never came back because he said, you stupid churches, all you guys do is talk about money. And I was like, bro, if only you knew what Restore Church does with money. Sometimes we forget to take an offering. I mean, but whatever. Um, but so, so today isn't about a bigger offering. Um, and then I want you to know, if you are new, 
We have zero financial expectation of you today. Like, if you were here today and you didn't give, the goal isn't to make you feel like garbage because you didn't give. There's, there's not a financial expectation. That, that's not what we're here for today. The, and here, here's the third thing we're not doing today, okay? Uh, we're not in a hurting place financially where I'm trying to preach to you out of crisis, okay? I just want you guys to, like, meet me where I'm at here. These are what we're not doing today. In fact, today's message has zero today, zero, very little, maybe a little bit, but very little to do with our financial standing as an quote unquote organization. It is everything to do with legitimately um, talking about things that God values, talking about our spiritual health, talking about ways that we glorify God. So I just, what I want to do today, I just want to accomplish one thing. I want those of you who are generous givers to see it as a more spiritual and worshipful thing than you do. And those of you who don't give, I want you to understand the spiritual nature of giving. Amen, family? Let's, let's just pray again over this very thought. Um, Father God, I, I, I pray... I pray that you would bless the generosity of Restore Church. Uh, this, this congregation is, is abundantly generous already. But, but may we not just be generous for the sake of generosity, O oh Lord. Would you, would you make us generous as an act of worship? A continual act of worship, and not even just with finances. May, may our generosity spill into the way we view our time, the way we view our talents, the way we view our energy. The way we view our home and, and our, our most valuable assets. May, may that be something that we view with a, with a generosity mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. So, Father, I just pray these blessings over today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, so, on that note, I want to kind of launch us off of Romans 12, and then we're going to jump all over the Bible today. So, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word in Romans 12:6? 12, 6. 12, uh, chapter 12, verses 6 through 8 says, In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And so if, if God has given you the ability to prophecy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. And if your gift is serving others, then serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. <clears throat> If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take it seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, then do it gladly. Now, as you have your seats, I just want to pull one principle out of this passage, and then we're going to jump all over the Bible. I want you to understand, giving is such a spiritual activity that God has designed it to be a spiritual gift. So in three weeks, we're going to start a series uh, called Supernatural, and it's going to be four weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and we're going to talk about spiritual gifts in greater detail then. But today, just let me, let me just lay something out for you. Most spiritual gifts are, are expectations of every Christian. I want you to just think about this. Not every spiritual gift, but most spiritual gifts are an expectation of every Christian. But spiritual gifts are, are what, what God does is when you get saved, the Spirit puts inside of you a giftedness where you are, have like a superpower at some of those general expectations. So some expected of everybody, but those of you who have a spiritual gift of this or that, God puts something in you where you are, are super at it, right? So when he's talking about this, um, there's a general expectation that everybody should be a teacher of the word, not a pastor, but a teacher of the word to those in your sphere of influence, right? Everybody has that expectation, but some have a giftedness to use it well, right? And you go so on and so on and so on. And what I want to point out today is that giving is such a spiritual thing that God said, of all of the traits and expectations I have for my people, I'm going to make giving a superpower one of them. Are you with me, family? That giving is a spiritual gift. That's how spiritual it is. And what's, what's amazing is, how do you exercise the gift of giving? Through generosity. It's a spiritual gift, and you exercise it by being generous. And I think this could maybe change some people's lives today, because don't, don't some of us do this, right? Even, even the generous among us, we give because I am supposed to make a donation, right? We give because taxes, or, or probably the, the most common reason maybe we give, maybe isn't worshipful, but maybe it's because we believe in the mission of what the church is doing, and we want to make sure the church is funded, right? And, and I'm saying that don't give for that reason anymore. Give as an act of worship. Give as a spiritual discipline. Amen, family? 
So, so don't, don't give out of obligation. And if you, if you are, I, w- I would even argue, don't, just, just don't. Don't bother. Give as a spiritual act of worship. Man, uh, no, nobody preaches sermons to try to decrease giving. What am I doing today? Man, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Here's, here's, how, here's how valuable our heart of giving is towards God. Here, I want to give you some Bible trivia here. Um, the Bible uses the word prayer. Could you guess how many times the word prayer is in the Bible? About 500 times. From Genesis to Revelation. The word faith, guess how many times it's in the Bible? Around 500. Prayer, faith, 500, 500 from Genesis to Revelation. Okay? The, did you know that there are over 2,000 references to money and finances in the Bible? So to statistically speaking, here's what I want you to understand. Um, about one out of every 10 verses in the New Testament talk about money. If you average it out, 16 of Jesus' 38 parables talk about money. About 25% of Jesus' teaching was about money. Jesus taught about money more than anything else. And so, so could, could we maybe just make a, a decision today as a church that we're, we're not going to be people who are funny about money, as a friend of mine says, that, that like, if Jesus talks about it that much, can we just, can we just cut the, can we just kind of cut through the fog and say, we're okay talking about uncomfortable things? You know, like, I, I've heard there's some faith organizations that, uh, cults, um, I shouldn't say that, that make you provide, like, your, your W-4 at the end of the year to make sure you're giving enough, okay? We're not, we're not, we're not saying anything like that, okay? And, and what we're saying is, um, can, can we just have permission from one another to speak about giving as an act of worship. Can we, can we just do that and not make it awkward on our pastors? Here, here's why I say this. Um, I was blown away because I was doing some research, and one of the boldest pastors I know who I, I follow his ministry, and he's, he's one of the kind of ministers where, like, when he talks to his congregation, he just, like, pow. Like, he just, uh, he just, he just lets it rip and just gets right in their face. But when he talked about his giving sermon, here, here's how he analyzed this data. He said... If you look at Jesus' ministry, he said, I probably should start talking about giving every fourth Sunday. And in doing so, I would be more aligned with the ministry of Jesus if he talks about it 25% of the time. He said, if I did that, I would be more aligned with the teachings of Christ, and yet I purposely don't do it because I would be alienating you. Am I crazy? Am I crazy? So, so what I want to do is, is, like I said, I want to cut through the fog today and just, I told you those three things that today is not. So if you start thinking those things, just pluck those thoughts out of your head. That's not what today's about. Um, but it is about acknowledging a spiritual thing that we need to talk about. Amen? So let me give you today, I want to give you two energizing reminders about generosity and three powerful ways to give as an act of worship. Is that fair? Okay, two energizing reminders. Energizing reminder number one, you are a steward, not an owner. Right? You are a steward, not an owner. In fact, I put it in your notes in the first person because I want you to say it to yourself. I am a steward, not an owner. In fact, just turn to someone next to you if you feel comfortable and just say, say, hey, I'm a steward, not an owner. Just turn next to someone and just, just say it out loud and own it. Just own up to it. I'm a steward, not an owner. I'm a steward, not an owner. So look at Psalm 24, 1 with me. It says, it says this, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to God. And and that's probably a really good starting point for this conversation. In your heart of hearts, do you view everything you have as yours, or do you view everything you have as God's? Because the reality is, and eternity will confirm this truth, everything is God's. Here's how you can test that truth. Are you ready for this? When you die, you will take nothing with you. And you will enter a kingdom in which you see God seated on his throne. And guess what? Guess what that throne will represent? His ownership over everything. So time and eternity will prove this truth to every single one of us. 
that we own nothing. You are a steward and not an owner. And, and so, so here, here's what I, want to, I just really want us to wrestle with. Do I believe what I have is mine? Or do I believe that what I have is God's? And, and when, when, I, when I think about that, the, the very idea of, of everything being God's instead of mine, that spiritually energizes me. Are you with me, family? Suddenly, everything I have access to means a little bit more than it did before. If everything's God and I have access to all the things I, I have access to, that changes everything for me. That's God's. I better be careful with that. Right? It even, it even influences the things I don't keep, right? Um, this, is, this is God's, and so therefore, why am I keeping it cluttered with garbage? I'm more intentional at throwing things out as well when I acknowledge that everything's God's. Amen, family? That changes everything. So, so think about this, okay? This facility we're in, which I think eventually we're going to have to have a conversation of if we, if we buy it or build something bigger. I just think we need to start having that conversation pretty soon. Because um, um, it's, it's not our landlord's. It's not ours. This is, this is God's stage. Okay? This is God's. And, and the vehicle you drove in to get here is not yours. It's God's. And the house you left before you came here in the car that you drove to get here is not yours. It's God's. And the TV you were watching last night before you went to bed is not yours. It's God's. And so just follow that whole thing. The, last night, the thing you were doing on whatever you were doing it with is not yours. It's God's. The place you were doing it is not yours. It's God's. The thing you used to get here from there to, after you were doing that thing is not yours. It's God's. And now the place you're at is not yours. It's God's. In fact, the person next to you, your loved one that you're sitting here with, your family, okay, is not yours. It's God's. It's not yours. It's God's. What does that mean? You are a steward, not an owner. So I, I remember when Brittany and I got married, I didn't have a very nice car. And so my amazing brother-in-law, where is he at? He's here somewhere. I think he's out in the lobby. Uh, Brittany's brother has amazing, amazing Camaro. He has a new amazing Camaro, but back then he had, he had this amazing Camaro. And I felt really special because... He let me drive it for our getaway car because I want, we wanted to do it right away from the wedding in style. It has this really neat little, you flip this switch and you push this button and it locks up the brakes so you can do really awesome burnouts. <laughs> and I, I almost crashed it. You can see the tire marks, you know, 12 years later, they're still there because I burned them so good into the road. They redid the road, but the burn marks stayed there because the, burn the burnout was that good. Okay, that's, that's how good. And uh, I started sliding sideways because I just, I just couldn't let it go. It was like 50, 50 feet and just oh, tore, it up, tore it up. Okay, but... Um, <laughs> Nobody was ever allowed to drive that car, were they, Anne? Okay, Brittany's mother's over here in the front. And um, um, I don't think Anne was even allowed to drive it up to that point. Just once. <laughs> Just once. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, I respect my brother-in-law. I want to start the marriage off well. Okay, I don't want to start marriage by being murdered. Okay, are, are you with me, family? That's not a good way to start it. And so because of whose it is, I have a level of respect on how I want to care for it. So fast forward the story, we go to the Utica dance hall for our wedding dance, and when we could finally sneak away at like 1 a.m., we tried to leave at like 10, and every time we got to the door, they just like pulled us back, and man, we can cut some rug, I'm just telling you. Um, just telling you, I think we're going to have an annual church dance party in the works or something. Talk to Abe and Reba if you want to do that. Um, but <laughs> just telling you, just telling you, we're going to do all the things. Okay. So as we're getting ready to leave... The car won't go. I don't want to start marriage by being murdered, but the car won't go. And so I put it in. It's a, it's a six-speed, and I, man, I'm, I'm ready to just tear it up in this thing. And I'm ready to go, but the car's not ready to go. And I'm flooring it, man. <laughs> And it feels like it should be going, and stupid me, I even like floored it through first and into second. And I'm like, man, this baby should be going. What I found is what they did is they, they wrapped streamers around the back bumper to hide that they put a floor jack underneath the rear suspension. <laughs> so the wheels were suspended in the air. And I'm, th and, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking, 
I don't want to start marriage by being murdered, but I'm willing to start it by being a murderer to all my groomsmen. I'm just telling you, okay, for pulling this prank on me. I'm freaked out. Why? Because I'm a steward and not an owner, right? It's not mine, and I respect whom it belongs to. I'm a steward and not an owner. I'm a steward and not an owner. Listen, you are all a steward and not an owner. That should change the way you look at things. Even if you take great care of your things, you're going to take better care of that which you are a steward over. Amen, family? You're a steward and not an owner. Number one. Number two, if I am a steward, then I will invest everything and give away nothing. That might sound like a weird statement coming from a pastor of a church that's known for its generosity, but let me explain what I mean. Let me, in fact, let me say it a different way. What I give is always a heavenly investment. Are you with me, family? That's right there in your notes. What you give is never truly given away. It's always a heavenly investment. If it doesn't belong to you, everything you do with it is an investment decision. Right? Everything. Look at, look at what Jesus says in Luke 12, 33. He says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Everything you do with what you have is a decision on whether you invest in heavenly things or not. You are a steward, and so what you do is an investment decision. Look at what he says in Matthew 5. He says, Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who are before you. So I want you to just unpack this with me. Listen. So when you give well or receive poorly, you're investing in heavenly treasure. Amen? You are a steward and not an owner. I'm going to say that one more time. When you give well or receive poorly, you're making heavenly investments. Why? Because you were a steward and not an owner. That should pump us up. Amen, family? Remember we talked about a couple weeks ago or last week? When you're worried, God isn't. One of the reasons he's not worried is he's sovereign, but one of the reasons he's not worried is because it's his stuff anyways. He's going to take care of his stuff in the way it needs taken care of. Right? It's his stuff. And you're a steward of his stuff. So, <clears throat> true story. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this, but I'll just confess with you because we're living these things together. Uh, I, for a while, I lived in an area where I was surrounded by panhandlers all the time. And I got to a point, I was just, I was just fed up with panhandlers because I, I just was running out of things to give them. I just, I can't not give things to panhandlers. And I'm not, uh, here's what, I respect panhandlers. I'm not saying, it, like, let me hear, finish this story if you think I'm, like, mocking panhandlers. But it was the time where all those gotcha videos were going around the internet where, like, they would follow the panhandler and you'd watch them, like, leave panhandling to go get it in their Mercedes and they follow them home to, like, their, you know, their mansion. And, and I was just, I was just, she's kind of fed up with that whole situation. And so one day I finally decided, you know, and I had some company visiting me, and I decided, you know what? I'm going to teach everybody not, not to give to those panhandlers. And the Lord convict, convicted me so deeply, he like cracked a whip on me. He, he, and here, here's what he taught me. He taught me this. I want to make sure I say it right. It doesn't matter what they do with my gift. It matters how my heart is postured to those who appear to be in need. Let me say that again, right? It doesn't matter what they do with my gift. It matters how my heart is postured towards those who appear to be in need. Right? And so, so let, me, let, me, let me unpack this a little bit deeper for you. Okay? If somebody misuses your gift, okay, and I'm not, say, I'm not saying make unwise investments, okay? So hear me out. I'm not saying, but if somebody misuses your gift, what did Jesus just teach you in Matthew 5? Tr heavenly investment. Okay? You're always making an investment when you help people in those situations. So number one, you're, you're investing in your own treasure in heaven. Number two, in the same situation, you're investing in their life because I will never give anything to anybody without talking to them about Jesus. That's just a rule. In fact, it gives me an excuse to talk about Jesus with somebody. Okay? Number three, um, it also is an investment in the lives of those around me in my circle who, who I'm modeling for them, and so are you, on this is how we treat people who appear to be in need. 
Amen, family? The, the, so what matters is my, my posture towards those in need. And then the fourth thing is maybe, maybe they misuse your gift. But maybe your act of generosity was the one thing that changed their life so that they don't misuse people's gifts anymore. And maybe your one act of generosity is the one thing that led them to salvific faith in Jesus Christ and transforms their whole life because maybe they, maybe, maybe they spent their whole life misusing anything and everything from everybody, but your one gift was that defining transformative moment. Amen, family? So what are we going to do? We are going to have a postured heart of generosity. Right? And, and I'm not just saying this about panhandlers. I'm saying this about anything and everyone. Right? What matters is the posture of your heart towards those in need. So here we have two reminders about generosity, two energizing reminders. Reminder number one, we are stewards, not owners. And number two, if I am a steward, then I will invest everything and give away nothing. Or the other way we have it for our notes is what you give is always a heavenly investment. So here, here's what I want to do. I want to get crazy practical right now. And for the time we have left, I want to give you three important ways to invest in heavenly things. Are you ready, family? This is the quietest you've been all year. People really are funny about their money, aren't they? Man. Man, just turn to someone next to you and say, hey, it's okay. Just tell them it's okay. It's okay. I, I told you we're not taking a second offering. I told you we're not. It's okay. You don't have to be stressed out. You guys are stressing me out. You guys are stressing me out. Three important ways to make heavenly investments. And, and number one, and I borrowed these, these from another ministry. I just love them so much. Number one, invest spontaneously. Right? And so if you're taking notes, we're going to invest spontaneously. So, so when there is a situation like I described, we, we see a need, what we do is we say, hey, you know what? Praise God, he's given me the ability to provide this need. So praise God, I'm, I'm excited. God, thank you for the honor. I'm going to provide for this need. A really great example of this is a guy called, we call the Good Samaritan in the Bible. And if you guys aren't familiar with the story, let me just give you the abridged version. Uh, there was a Jewish man who was beat up and left pretty much for dead on the side of the road. And some of the religious elite of the Jewish community, they saw him, and what did they do? They went on the other side of the road as to avoid him and not provide aid. Until this, uh, this Samaritan man, who Samaritans and Jews have some hostility between them, and normally they wouldn't interact with each other, but the Samaritan, he saw the guy, he dressed his wounds, and he took him to this inn, and he didn't just leave him there, he said, listen, I'm going to pay for his stay, and I'm going to come back, and if there's anything else that needs taken care of, I'm going to provide for that too. Are you with me, family? Now, I want you to understand, why did he do that? He didn't have a plan. All he did is he woke up for the day and he said, Lord, I'm your servant. As you need of me, I will fulfill for them. Amen? As you need of me, I will fulfill for them. He just woke up as a willing and ready servant to take care of the needs of whoever he crossed, literally on his path. And thus doing so, he probably saved this guy's life. Amen? What are we going to do? We're going to give spontaneously. A really a couple beautiful stories. Just recently, a couple weeks ago, we we're going and we we're serving at the homeless shelter. We have a mission team. We're serving at the homeless shelter for a couple of days. And, and our mission team said, hey, what are your critical needs that nobody's taking care of for you? Because you go to these organizations, people do it here too. Like every nonprofit organization, a lot of people want to give to certain needs, but there's other needs people don't care about, right? So we said, hey, what are the needs that nobody's taking care of? And they're like, well, we're doing this big expansion. We have 24 new beds that we're building, uh, but so far we haven't got any sheets for those beds. So our mission team's serving, and I make a quick phone call to a special someone who likes to go shopping for us, and, and I said, hey, we need, 20, we need 24 sheets, and sheets ain't cheap, right? They're not cheap. <clears throat> so a um, so person just goes and runs the store, grabs all the sheets that, this, that the organization needs, and the homeless shelter's like catching up with me, and we do like a debrief every night to talk about like how our day went. And they're like, hey, did, did we make sure that we're going to get those sheets sometime soon? And I was like, hey, sister, it's already done. It was done within two hours of your request, and it was taken care of because God's people take care of the people's needs. Can I get an amen? That's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we do. Um, it's a similar story. So, so then we go from the homeless shelter, we go to the woman's shelter, and we're like, hey, we're going to help out the woman's shelter. And we say the same question. What are your critical needs that nobody wants to take care of? And they're like, well, 
we need some file cabinets and some office chairs. And I'm like, that makes sense. Nobody cares about nonprofit office equipment, right? When you look at our budget, does anybody get excited? Like, yes, the office equipment budget, preach. Like, like just we shell out the donations for that. Like, like everybody's like, I want all of my money to go to salary and office supplies. That's what everybody wants their donations to go to. Yeah, right? Let's, let's do that. And so uh, what the mission team did is they went and they shopped around, they're like, man, this stuff's expensive. No wonder nobody wants to buy you file cabinets. File cabinets ain't cheap either. And so what, what they did was they said, you know what? We actually, five hours away in our home in Missouri, we have some friends who own an office store. I'm going to call them up. And they called their office store friends, and they donated all the office equipment. They drove the next, the next week, they drove back to Missouri, and they hauled it, loaded it in a trailer. They drove back to Yankton to drop it off at the woman's shelter, because what do we do? We provide and we give spontaneously. Amen, family? And I could go all day on this. Man, this sermon's going to be long because I got so many good stories to tell about how great you guys are. Okay? The second thing we do is we invest strategically. So we give spontaneously, but we also invest strategically. What do we do? So, so some of us hear these stories and say, man, I wish I could give more. Now remember, today's sermon isn't about me getting money from you for the church. That's not my goal. My goal is about your worship towards God. Amen? I want you to hear that. But some of you hear these stories and you say, man, I wish I could give more. But let me tell you the good news. This is going to sound like an infomercial. If you want to give more, just wait. You can. <laughs> You can. <laughs> if you can, if you're strategic about it, right? And so the, the, the idea of a tithe is an Old Testament principle where you give the first 10% to the Lord, right? And what that really does is it says, in my heart, I prioritize what I'm going to give to God first and above all else. So we, if, if you're strategic, the reality is if you want to give more, you can. You just have to plan. If you have a plan, then you can. I love how Isaiah 32, 8 is worded in the New Living Translation. It says, generous people plan to do what is generous. It says, noble people plan to do what is noble, right? And so if you're a spiritually generous person, what are you going to do? You're going to spiritually plan generosity, right? And, but but what, do, what do a lot of us do? If we, can, we, can I just kind of just just get it out there just for a minute? Are we okay, family? What do men, are, we, are we okay? Are we comfy yet? Are we uncomfortable? Are we good? This message stresses me out, so meet me in the middle a little bit. Come on, okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> We're, we're, our, we announced we're going to go to two services after today. We're going to need to go to half a service, okay? Uh, so there you go. There you go. Um, but what do many of us do is we don't plan to give. We plan to spend. We plan to consume, right? We earn to buy, right? We earn to get. We claim that which we want, and we make a plan to purchase it, even to the extent of going into ridiculous levels of debt to do so. We say, I want that. I want, I'm going to earn so I can get that. Amen, family? We do it. We plan to spend. We plan to spend. As children of God, who are stewards of his things, what are we? We're spiritual investors. We're spiritual contributors. We don't believe the church exists for us. We believe we are the church, and the church exists for the world. And we strategize about that. By the way, you have a great leadership team. We, we, we were at my house till 11 o'clock last night working on our 2022 budget. They spent five or six hours just going over numbers again and again and again. And this is meeting number two of three meetings to work on a budget just because they're so careful and protective of how they spend the, the donations we make here. And that's, that's one of our commitments to our stewardship here. We plan to invest. Let me tell you two of the most powerful strategic giving stories that I've ever experienced. One of them was... Um, there's, I don't, I, I don't know who gives what. I don't know. In fact, when we do the offering, I close my eyes as I stand up front because I just don't want to know. And most, just so you know, nobody else knows what you do either except for the treasury department because everybody else is too busy worshiping Jesus. The only reason the offering's up here is because there's no room in back. I'm just telling you. Um, <clears throat> but... There's, there's somebody who looks at our budget every year. I, I just talk, there's a few people who like to talk about that stuff, so we do talk about it. And what they do is they look at our annual budget every year, and they have make a personal goal to provide 10% of our annual budget. Did you guys know that? That's their strategy. They say, hey, you know what? 
Whatever the budget is, my goal is 10%. That's their tithe, 10% of the budget. Another really powerful story is for most of the life of our church, I've always worked part-time at another job for most of the life of our church. And one of the most empowering things that has ever happened to me was I had a, a man of God from right here at Restore uh, take me out for lunch one time, he and his, his dear wife, and um, they asked me a really powerful question I never thought of before. He said, Pastor, I know you work full-time, but we pay you to be a part-time pastor. He said, what would it take to make you full-time? And nobody's ever thought, nobody ever has talked to me about my time that way before. It was incredibly meaningful. I said, what would it take to make you full-time? And I didn't have an answer because I just always thought I'm going to work more elsewhere so that I'm not a burden on our church. And he said, no, no, pastor, you don't understand what I'm saying. What would it take? Because I want to make it happen. Because I think that, I think that staffing our church is a good investment. I don't think that you're a burden on the church. I think that you're a good investment. And I'm not saying this to talk about my, my, my situation or anything. I'm just saying this. So powerful because what this man wanted to do is strategically give so that his church could grow in the way that we needed to grow financially. And ever since then, um, as I told you, um, I, I did go full-time, and it was all empowered by that man's conversation. And now my wife is able to uh, stay home with our kids. <laughs> And actually, she's, she's our children's ministry director now, too, on a part-time basis. But, but it all started because one person said one thing. I want to do this strategically because I think it's a good thing. And so let me tell you one more story. I told you last week how my wife had to abruptly quit her job. And, and because of strategic thinkers like my friend I just described, our, our, this isn't because of him, but our income got cut in half overnight. But you know what didn't get cut in half overnight? Our giving. Why? Because we strategically plan what we're going to give, and our income got cut in half, and our giving didn't. And again, I'm not saying that to make this about me. I'm just telling you, we're, we're living the things we're talking about together. Amen? So what are we? We're investors. What do we do? We, we give spontaneously. But we don't just give spontaneously. We give strategically. But we don't just give strategically. Let me give you one more. We will invest sacrificially. Right? If you're taking notes, we give sacrificially. We, we invest spontaneously, we invest strategically, we invest and we give sacrificially. There's this really powerful passage in Mark 12. In Mark 12, Jesus is watching the people giving their offering into the temple. You guys, are you guys remembering this story? He's watching the, the people give, and there's some, some wealthy people who gave in abundance. But then this little lady comes in, and she just gives like, like two pennies. She just gives a little, just a little bit, but it was all she had. And so she, Jesus brought his disciples. He brought his disciples, and he said, hey, hey, guys, I want you to check something out. He said, you see that woman there who just gave all she had, even though it wasn't very much? She gave more than everybody. And what, what's so interesting about this story is, um, man, he points out, they gave out of their wealth, but out of her poverty, she put everything they had. And here's what's amazing. Jesus didn't stop her. Here, here's, here's what I want you to think of. If, if you and I were witnessing this transaction take place and we knew somebody was in need, what are we going to do? We're going to say, no, don't put your offering in. We're going to take the offering out for your needs. By the way, we have a fund called the Galatians 610 Fund. That uh, Galatians 6.10 says, provide for those in need, especially those in the family of faith. And last night at our meeting, um, we weren't content with it, so we quadrupled it for 2022 because we're not, it's our spontaneous giving fund. And we quadrupled it because we're not done helping people. We want to increase our generosity. Amen, family? If you want to get excited about that, that'd be okay. If you want to get excited, that's okay. We can worship. Okay? But, but... <laughs> Jesus didn't stop her because he didn't want to rob her of the blessing of investing in heavenly things. Amen, family? Jesus didn't stop her because he didn't want to rob her of the blessing of investing in heavenly things. So this is who we are. We are stewards of things that don't belong to us. They belong to God. 
We are stewards. What are we going to do? We're going to invest in heavenly things. And here's what I want to be very clear about today. I started by telling you what we're not about, okay? This message isn't about restore church's, uh, you know, bottom line at the end of the budget year. That's not what it's about. Here, here's what I want to tell you, okay? Um, this is about your worship. And so let me tell you something. I'm quoting another pastor almost verbatim from this. I loved it so much. Um, give radically to a church, and it doesn't have to be this church. Let, let me just say something abundantly clear. If you don't believe in, in me leading you as a church, or what we're doing as a church, or the gospel that we're preaching as a church, then I, I'll just be really clear. Don't give here. And go find a church with a pastor and a leadership that you believe in the mission of what they're doing, that they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for your sins, he rose on the third day, that, that death cannot conquer him, that his blood washes away every sin, not some sin, but every sin. And, and find a church that preaches and proclaims that till kingdom comes, and, and one that you believe in and give there. Because I don't care about our bottom line today, I care about your worship. Amen, family? So, so do that. Amen. 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 And, and then go there and don't just give them your hard-earned paycheck. Give them your time. Give them your talent. Give them your energy. Okay? Use your spiritual gifts for the investment of the kingdom of heaven there. Do that. Do that. But, so here's what we're not about. It's not about our bottom line, but here's what it is about. Are you ready, family? In the last 12 months through your giving, we, we are a debt-free organization. We always have been, and I'd like to keep it that way, but we're going to have to make some big decisions to grow this church beyond what it's at. We're at capacity every week. But here's what. We're a debt-free organization. Okay? We, you guys have quadrupled our giving in the last two years. In the, in the, last, in the last one year, we, we built a kids' campus. We have, we have Yankton's only only indoor kids campus, and that might not seem like a big deal to you, but there's going to be a generation of kids who go through harsh, cold D Dakota winters, and they will not know what a world looks like generationally where there's not a fun place that their parents can take them to play that's warm, and you're providing that for free for Yankton in the last 12 months. In the last 12 months, through our G610 fund, I think we've helped over 200 people, which is our yearly average. When the homeless shelter is full, guess who gets called? Restore Church, who always provides, almost always provides, a place to stay for somebody who, when the homeless the shelters full. When you give at Restore, uh, over the last couple years, we've been able to, to do all these things and so much more. We were able to take a leap of faith and we started in a uh, pastoral assistant program who provides um, um, almost free pastoral secretary service to pastors in small churches that can't afford secretaries. And so we have five or six different churches that we service through our assist service. In the last one year, um, we probably reached over, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000. It's hard to track people online. In the last year, we've helped, we've helped thousands of peoples, peoples, thousands of people all across the planet with the most critical needs you can think of, from clean drinking water to, to education in classrooms to um, building schools. And you guys have done this for thousands of people over the last, just in the last 12 months with what you do. So I wanted to let you know, what we're not about is our bottom line, but these are the values that we are about. We've given away probably 500 Bibles in the last six years, okay? And I could just go on and on and on and on, but this is what we're about. And here's what I want to close with, okay? Okay. Um, I want you to understand how incredibly spiritual giving really is because it's at the heart of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. For God so loved the world that out of his expression of love he presented a gift to the world. It's the heart of the gospel generosity, that, that he, he, he spoke into a world of sinful people like you and me, and he said, here's a gift that you do not deserve, because you've rebel, rebelled against my kingdom, says the Lord, but because I love you, I'm going to give you a precious gift that you don't deserve, and I'm going to send my son. And though he knew no sin, he what? He became sin himself. He took all of our sin upon him on the cross. He's giving, and he's giving, and he's giving, and he's giving. And he gave his life, he gave his blood on the cross. Shed every drop, 
And as he did so, he reached through eternity, past, eternity, present, and he took all of your sin. Are you with me, family? He took all of it. He didn't miss any along the way. He took all of it. And he placed it upon himself, and he held it on that cross exactly as long as it took to wash you clean. The heart of the gospel is giving. And what he did when he did that is he gave you the gift so that if you believe in him, you'll have everlasting life. Everlasting life. And if you're here today and you couldn't look me in the eyes with confidence and say, if, if I went, if I left this world today, if I died today, I know for certain I'd spend eternity in heaven with Jesus because I received that gift. And I want to talk to you before you leave. In fact, uh, ministry apprentice Jacob's going to be at the back door at the end of the service, uh, ready to talk and pray to anybody who needs to talk and pray today. So normally I like to have you raise your hand or stand up or do something to participate. But since this is kind of sensitive, here's what I want to do. I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm going to pray. We're going to have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And it's up to you. We're here to help you as much as you want helped in this arena. If you want somebody to talk to you about more about salvation, then be assertive and make yourself known. If you need help being generous, um, we have a dear sister who just got certified as a financial coach just so she could offer free coaching services to people. We will help you as much as we can. You just got to make it known. So let's pray. Father God, purify my heart. That's easy to say things out loud. Actually, sometimes that's even hard. But Lord, I know, how, I, know how, I know I have secret areas in my heart where sometimes I'm greedy and stingy, and I pray that you purify that out of me with greater generosity. Oh Lord, I, I pray that we would be a congregation where, where we're not funny about money, <laughs> that we're just abundant givers. That, that, Lord, we would transform the world like we see in the book of Acts, where, where the church just can take care of every need. And, and through that, we're providing practical needs as we give spiritual truth, and we're going to lead every person, every person to know and love you. And God, anoint us with a, with a gifting to have that kind of success where, where people are just, just saved left and right because we just have a gift of witnessing and a gift of evangelism, a gift of discipleship, and that, that we're generous with the gospel, that we aren't stingy with the gospel, that we generously give it and speak it and apply it and live it and demonstrate it and share it and proclaim it and everything we can do with the gospel to lead many to you, O Lord. Transform our hearts based on what we've spoken of today. In Jesus' name and for your good pleasure, O oh Lord. Amen.